No, no. Not highest number. We 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 are just three thirty bed at this point, with uh, forty bedded uh, adult ICU setup, twenty bedded neonatology setup, and uh, about six bedded pediatric setup, uh, critical care, and uh, few obstetric beds are there. But uh, currently, we manage in the main ICU itself. So obstetric ICU is uh, designed, but uh, not in practical use. Uh, after COVID, I think uh, we are not used much. So. That is used as uh, currently the HD or recovery for the patient, but uh, obstetric patients are in the main ICU at this point of time. Okay. Hello, sir. Good evening, sir. How are you, sir? Hi. How are you, uh, Klesh? I'm fine, sir. Fantastic, sir. Good, good. Good to see, you, sir. Long time. Yeah, we met in Indore. Now, after that, I think. Okay. Yes, 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 sir. And, so this um, is one of the important topics here. Obstetric emergencies are one of the important topics, not only for intensives, but I think it will be very useful for obstetricians also. Yes. Yeah, so I have asked my colleagues, the obstetrician colleagues, to join. I hope they join. And okay, uh, yeah, that uh, hope you people also have done the same thing because you know the, yes, it's, yes. it's basically teamwork, and uh, uh, only intensive is, is the part role because it right starts right from as we will be discussing. From emergency and goes yep. uh, to ICU and obstetricians, of course, are involved. Right, sir. Right, sir. So, uh, sir, in uh, one or two minutes, uh, we'll start, sir. Already yeah, no. we'll no join. We are all set. Yeah. So, in two uh, we'll, we'll be starting soon, sir. Yeah. And a lot of obstetricians have seen, have shown keen interest in understanding obstetric emergencies from a critical care perspective. Recently, we met one of the legendary obstetricians who is known to Dr. Gunadhar also. He is his teacher also. We met him in uh, one of the conference. He diligently comes for the obstetric, uh, I mean, for a critical care conferences. And uh, he's very keen for critical care, you know, as far as obstetrics, uh, obstetricians are concerned. I mean, uh, there has been a lot of... Uh, you know, responsibility shared by the obstetricians and the intensivists together. Uh, I think maternal mortality can also be taken care of. Because obstetricians are always afraid of maternal mortality. And then they find it a little miserable that you know, there is no one to share the responsibility. The intensivists can definitely take the lead in this and can work together and can definitely reduce mortality. Yeah, so it's, it's a multi-pronged kind of approach, like right from emergency involving anesthesiologists right time, surgical decisions yeah. at right time, we'll be discussing all that. So we need to, uh, you know, enhance their involvement somehow, make uh, nice. involved uh, all the time, discuss nice. Uh, nice. all the care issues, discuss about this, nice. we'll be talking about that a bit. Nice. Yeah. So uh, nice. uh, we'll will uh, without uh, further delay sir we'll start yeah that's fine uh, so uh, good evening friends uh, so today we will have a very interesting session of strict emergencies uh, from the intensivist perspective and we have we have with us uh, our eminent speaker uh, dr bala sahib bande sir so uh, he needs no introduction i think uh, everybody uh, in uh, the critical care circle uh, one or sometime heard his lecture in the obstetrics and uh, he's uh, very famous in uh, uh, particularly uh, his subject area is this obstetric critical care and now uh, sir is uh, the senior consultant and uh, critical care director anesthesiology and medicine joint director in the Nobel hospital and research center pune so he has finished his md anesthesiology from the university of pune followed by md general medicine from the university of pune and European Diploma in Intensive Care in 2001, Fellow of Indian College of Critical Care Medicine in 2012, and he also had done diplomas in consumer laws, diplomas in medical legal studies, Law Institute from the Law Institute Pune. So he has a vast uh, experience in the field of critical care, uh, like uh, he's a postgraduate teacher, examiner, IDCCM teacher, inspector, I can say and uh, uh, he's basically a uh, reviewer of many journal editors and he's also the secretary indian college of critical care medicine from 2014 to 2016 vice president national indian society of critical care medicine from 2006 to 2008 
He is also a member of National Governing Council of Indian Society of Anesthesiologists, ISA, from 2012 to 2015. Uh, also, uh, he, is, he has delivered a lot of uh, 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 guest lectures and uh, different topics like high-risk anesthesia, transplant anesthesia, critical care, ethical and uh, legal issues, which is now one of the burning topic among the intensivists and anesthesiologists at various national conferences and uh, he's also an MMC accredited speaker. So with this vast experience and background, let's, let's welcome sir to our 49th episode of Apollo Mumbai Critical Care Learning Network, where we conduct our sessions every Thursday from uh, 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. Uh, and uh, I request all the delegates to put their questions at the end of the, uh, in the chat box and at the end of the talk, we'll this, sir will take some of the questions and we'll discuss. So with this, I welcome sir. Sir, uh, you can start your session. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, it was muted. So, can you hear me now, Gunadar? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, thank you very much for this opportunity. And I think uh, this is a very, very important topic and less often discussed than probably it needs to be discussed. So, I work in a 40 bedded intensive care unit, as I said before. So, we'll straight away go to this topic of obstetric emergencies. Uh, what is intensive perspective? So, our discussion will revolve around uh, hemorrhagic shock, eclampsia. Uh, peripartum respiratory distress, uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy, liver failure, and CPR as the time permits. So going further, uh, the postpartum hemorrhage is one of the most challenging areas in obstetrics. And uh, the blood losses which normally occur to this range, basically vagina delivery normally we accept 500 ml as a blood loss, cesarean section 1000 ml, elective uh, Caesarean hysterectomy, if at all, has to be done 1500 ml. So, this is also quite a big quantum. And the emergency caesarean hysterectomy be done, the tune can be up to 3000 ml of loss. So, that is quite a bit of a challenge. That's the usual blood losses which we've seen. Uh, we must know the common causes of hemorrhage in the obstetric. Basically, uh, we are uh, having a different drain at this point of time. So, yeah, Abrosio placenta and trauma, we all knew. But a lot of patients who are coming with placenta previa, acrita, increta, and percrita. And these patients invariably go for uh, increased number of interventions. And obviously, uh, most of them, even if they are elective, we need to be very prepared for uh, major interventions. And in postpartum period, obviously, uh, uterine atony leads the list. And the new addition of coagulopathies is coming because... Uh, there are many patients who are on some anticoagulants for some reason. And there is a presence of uh, tropical diseases like uh, dengue fever or get cell fever, which pregnant patients can catch up. And these number is also uh, on the rise. So we must change, uh, note the change in the demography of these uh, obstetric uh, complications which are happening. That is uh, placenta as well as coagulopathy related problems. And uh, this is very well known that ORTs as a major causes of uh, PPH. Uh, can you see the full screen because the upper part is getting a little bit hidden? Uh, we, we, are, we, will able to, we are able to see, sir. Okay, fine. That's fine. So, so yes, uh, fine, atony sir. and coagulation defects, as I said, are the major causes uh, of this particular. And even in the coagulopathy related, which are on the rise, in that besides usual uh, placenta related causes and eclampsia related causes, we are having increased number of liver disease patients, especially hepatitis B and E. And uh, in rainy season, which will be forthcoming, we may see more of hepatitis E patients. A and E come in rainy season as uh, uh, there is a fecal transmission, but uh, hepatitis A uh, is less common than hepatitis E. And hepatitis E can go to the level of encephalopathy and sometimes mortality also. And uh, as I said, thrombocytopenia is due to various uh, febrile and not to forget the Congenital abnormalities of the blood clotting. 
so we'll be having uh, cases and then we'll proceed further that uh, is uh, i mean usual experience of ours so as you can see this is a 28 year old g1 uh, 40 weeks uh, was diagnosed pih early early in the pregnancy was taken nifedipine but at some point it was diagnosed to be intrauterine fetal demise so they tried pregnancy termination and uh, patient was referred here in a bleeding shock status after giving one unit of blood and some uh, uh, hemaxil there so on arrival in the emergency room patient was uh, crashed needed urgent sir uh, we are not able to hear your voice so uh, sorry for the interruption i think there is a technical glitch uh, from uh, sir said so just let us uh, solve the issues and uh, thanks for all of your patience sir i think your network is little bit uh, issue Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Now we so can. I was I was talking about hypotension, which has these all uh, systemic effects, which includes prominently, let's say, metabolic acidosis. There can be pulmonary edema if we over transfuse or over infuse, respiratory distress because of that, and uh, there can be shock related cerebral insufficiency and as well as renal insufficiency. So all these systems practically get uh, affected. and uh, as the you know cartoon shows what we see is just a hypotension but below that lies a lot of systemic inflammatory response syndrome and this was a famous trial now which has become a quadrant actually addition of hypocalcemia so we have to take into consideration acidosis as we said before but the lower ones coagulopathy and hypothermia are rather neglected and we'll be talking about it because they have to be taken care simultaneously and they have equally important harmful effects on the body uh and we have to take care of them hypocalcemia is just been added to this triad it becomes a quadrant now hypocalcemia generally comes after massive transfusion which we usually undertake in this particular uh. so when we uh, have a volume resuscitation and uh, resuscitation in general we have to have some goals in our mind so we go for systolic blood pressure of say 80 to 100 and uh, we have to think of uh, airway oxygenation and ventilation at the same time and not to forget the control of hemorrhage because this is a time when you have to uh, get your colleagues all the systems including blood bank icu ot everything needs to be activated right at that time of uh, at that point of time so uh, we aim for hematocrit of 25 to 30% we do use uh, blood components as early as possible and there are certain situations where you will be using cryoprecipitate and uh, factor 7 etc but they are less often uh, needed platelet count we aim for more than 50000 and we try to have normalized calcium level as well and not to forget again i am emphasizing the hypothermia part of it we have to have normal temperatures uh, so all these things will be considered at one time and in that direction we will have our whole effort now what are the efforts we have to have large bore cannula if there is a peripherally inserted line big line or a cvp line if possible that is also done central line may be possible in emergency in many institutions okay so uh, if possible that is always done but at least two large bore cannulas done peripherally is the must because we need to give lot of volume for this particular patient and of course vasopressors also will be needed 
So we need two big lines, number 18 or bigger. Uh, we must have a pressure bag because we need to give volumes rather fast and the warmed solutions. Uh, we'll look, look into uh, how they can be warmed. There are cabinets available. Uh, colloids may also be needed, but as far as possible, we start with the uh, isotonic crystalloids. Now, these isotonic crystalloids, given in large volume, have some problems after the large infusions, like dilution of blood, there will be a decrement in the hematocrits, and that is the time when we will need the uh, fresh, uh, fresh is not available nowadays, but at least uh, FAPs and uh, platelet as well as PCVs, all the components at that point of time. And because of these components are coming from blood bank, they are cold, warming time may not be available, but uh, hypothermia is also again contributed by these particular uh, blood components as well. And uh, we all know that hypothermia promotes coagulopathy, so it is all interdependent. Because of high volume of chlorides being given, we know that there is a dilutional acidosis. So that's why we try to use balanced salt solutions. And uh, we have to have measurements of uh, electrolytes as well as obviously acid base status done at periodical intervals. So balanced salt solutions are uh, multiple available, but science has not shown uh, the evidence is not there in favor of all the balanced salt solutions. You can see that. Uh, there are a lot of balanced, besides ringer lactate, there are a lot of balanced salt solutions now available, which are a little costlier. But the comparison of all these have not shown any difference uh, to choose over normal saline or ringer lactate. Now, lactate is replaced by acetate, gluconate, and malate in most of these solutions. Uh, these solutions will also provide less chloride. So, hyperchloremic acidosis is uh, less often seen in this. And as I said, uh, there is no clinical evidence that uh, much of a outcome change is there. So it is up to you to change because there is a cost issue involved in this. Going further, this particular patient uh, uh, was quite moribund and you can see the temperature of 30.6 degrees Celsius, uh, sedated, fixed dilated, obviously because of vasopressors, nothing related to brain evaluation as a, we have not had done that. And uh, central line was done. Uh, Atrial line also is necessary because if you want to give vasopressors in a very precise manner, it is better that we have some arterial line with us. And it definitely improves because otherwise, looking at the uh, peripheral uh, NIBP or uh, this thing, they uh, may have some difficulties in deciding the dose of vasopressors, which we find arterial line really gives us a precision. So you can see the hemogram. It's quite uh, abnormal, a 4.3 hemoglobin. 32,000 count platelets, 87,000. Then uh, coagulation quite gone wrong. And look at the venous blood gas where uh, pH practically incompatible with the life with uh, uh, venous saturation of 40.9. So there is quite a bit of oxygen date uh, reflected. And not to forget, look at the bicarbonate, which is a 3.2, which is severely acidotic blood gas, which is here there, uh, venous blood gas. Uh, volume re uh, resuscitation was done. Patients did receive at this point of time uh, this is a typical treatment which goes on with uh, some shortcomings and look at the high vasopressor dose which will be needed at that point of time. And as I said, invasive BP monitoring really adds to the precision and uh, uh, ventilation also has to be adequate because all the acidotic patient, we cannot have or we cannot afford to have hypoventilation by any means. Of, uh, 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 by any means. So uh, if there is the entitled CO2 monitoring, that will be welcome because then you at least you can ensure that we are not hypoventilating because if you hypoventilate, then obviously acidosis will be worse and it will become a mixed acidosis. X-ray usually done after the central line which was put on the right uh, internal jugular and this shows the clear lung fluids. Now, most of the institutes will have a uh, echocardiography available as a point of care measure in the emergency itself or in the ICU. And we all know what is the importance of uh, echocardiography in having the evaluation of cardiovascular system. It not only will tell you that uh, heart chambers, size, the contractility, wall motion abnormalities, as well as emptiness of the hardware, walls will be kissing, etc. And not to forget, obviously, the IVC measurement, which we go by collapsibility and distensibility, collapsibility in the spontaneously breathing patient and distensibility in the uh, mechanically ventilated patient. So from IVC, uh, we can get some idea of the volume status so that we do not overload such patients because we have often seen in you know, over enthusiasm of 
doing volume resuscitation, we often have overloaded this patient. But I think availability of eco or uh, ultrasound machine as a point of care uh, availability, we will be able to be more precise on this. People have done studies where uh, collapsibility in a various state can have some surrogate measurement given about the uh, central venous pressure. So we'll look at the last part. That is where uh, uh, the collapsibility is uh, less than 50% uh, and size of the IVC is more than two centimeters. Obviously it will mean that it will be high CVP and you can have some restriction of volume at this point of time. So I think it's uh, without much overemphasizing, everybody should learn uh, basic echocardiography as well as ultrasonography. And I think it's need of the time uh, there are many workshops now being taken in most of the conferences. I think all the intensives how to get gear to learn all this. So we also need coagulation monitoring because this remains a little behind uh, looking at the respiration and cardiovascular uh, revival. We uh, somehow sideline coagulation and uh, temperature monitoring, etc. So we have to have coagulation clinical monitoring. Besides that, we can have all these tests. Uh, PT, PTTK, platelet count. And uh, if somebody has the facility of TEG available, that will really add to the precision. Basically, this is the machine, but the, this kind of graphs, if available, we can be very specific about which component can be uh, transfused or which component is in deficiency. So there are different patterns. This is not the time or not the scope of this lecture to discuss the TEG uh, uh, graphics, but it is very, very uh, essential that if somebody has it, it can be used in this particular patient and it will definitely add or avoid unnecessary transfusion of some components. As a basic rule, uh, when we do not uh, have anything at the point and we want to have volume resuscitation, we go by jumpstart uh, approach that is called as 111, that is 1 to 1 to 1 ratio of PCV, FFP and platelets. So that is essential because the volume will be decided by a clinical requirement or some other parameters and uh, necessity of cryoprecipitate and factor seven can be decided at appropriate times. Factor seven, most of the people, now it is not much in work, but it uh, like few years back, people used to give it as a desperate measure because as the bleeding never stopped, but basic requirement of that is it cannot stop the surgical bleeding. And unless the other components are uh, rectified or uh, uh, compensated or replaced, factor seven cannot act. So that is a limitation. Cryoprecipitate will be mostly needed in patients where there is no more volume of FAP will be tolerated because cryoprecipitate uh, is little more concentrated in vibration content and volume overload uh, will be indication where you still want to give coagulation factors. Cryoprecipitate will also obviously be preferred. What is neglected is a metabolic side or metabolic harmful effects of the blood transfusion, which are in terms of say hypocalcemia due to cited toxicity, the treatment is obviously replace the calcium and monitor the calcium. And hyperkalemia because sometimes there may be hemolysis in the PCV and massive transfusions can uh, increase the potassium level to quite harmful level. So we have to have uh, uh, repeated watch on blood gas status as well as electrolyte status and treat them if required. And uh, obviously treatment is in terms of calcium, soda bicarb and intravenous glucose insulin treatment. Hypothermia, as I said, uh, there are a lot of deleterious effects of hypothermia, which will be in terms of metabolic dysfunction at cellular level, arrhythmias at heart level, and coagulopathy in general. So these effects can actually contribute to morbidity and mortality. So not to forget of hypothermia. These kind of cabinets are commercially available. They should always be there in the ICU and emergency room and OT, uh, always on and uh, at any given point of time, crystalloids and colloids should be available at the temperature of 39 to 40 degrees Celsius, which is constantly set and this machine is constantly kept on so that we have a constant supply. Besides that, this can be online uh, inline warming for uh, fluids, which is being infused or transfused. These are also available. And uh, external warming blankets, which are available like this bear agar as well as uh, equator uh, from different uh, companies are available. Now these sheets, uh, there are surgical access blankets also, as you can see the hole in between. And if this patient is to be taken for surgery, then uh, in OT also, you in OT emergency and ICU at all places, these should be available simultaneously. So you cannot carry these from one place to another as far as possible. If required, of course, you can. But uh, in OT also, this is to be planned that when OT gets activated, anesthesiologists uh, have to see that this is available. Okay, so this we all mostly know. Uh, there are some blankets which are 
put underneath the patient. So there are some such blankets which are available, uh, indigenously made and even imported ones are available. So when we look at this particular patient, uh, we, we have competing priorities in terms of uh, taking care of so many factors which we discussed at this point of time. But at the same time, <coughs> uh, PPH uh, management guidelines also are there from the uh, World Health Organization and uh, use of these oxytocin, prostaglandins and uh, uh, tranexamic acid, which has recently been shown in 2017. The woman trial showed that tranexamic acid one gram given intravenously will be useful and if required, it can be repeated after 30 minutes. So this is the description about that. We'll not go much into detail, but just remember tranexamic acid can help to control the bleeding in these particular patients. This is all pharmacological intensive care management. The a little bit about uh, mention about the uh, there are some surgical uh, maneuvers which will be necessary at the same time because we need to control the image at the same time we cannot keep managing bleeding patient for uh, metabolic cardiovascular and respiratory but we have to go for surgical management as well so there are multiple ways it can be as you can see there are intrauterine uh, balloon tamponades and there are other temporizing measures which are available like bimanual uterine compression vaginal pack uh, external aortic compression. This is the typical Bakri balloon. Uh, and this was studied and this is the old report in 2012, where uh, in Europe they have studied and tried to find out with a reasonable success rate for this particular balloon to have a tamponade and uh, stop the bleeding. Now, these are additional uh, maneuvers or manual measures which can be taken up uh, by our colleagues uh, from the obstetrics. Uh, we're not going to detail, but these are definitely required at the same time of uh, or when we are managing, we have to think of that when they will come in and plan for this. Uh, many people have used uh, uh, internal iliac artery ligation and there was one study from our site. These are typical billing sutures. Uh, this was from uh, KM Hospital where I was working previously, where uh, this study was done, where they did a uh, prophylactic internal iliac ligation in these particular patients and they found it was 100% successful to that where either uh, a number of hysterectomies were less our patient uh, had a very uh, good outcome after doing this. So that is one major which can be done. In, in uh, recent times, we have uh, uh, uterine time, uh, uterine artery ligation as well, people have been advising. Now, in recent times, uh, endovascular techniques are also available. Though we are not practicing, but I'm sure where the cath lab is available, all these things will come in uh, hope because uh, it's about almost two decades now, this particular uh, 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 evidence has been created. and. Uh, one of the Japanese study in the beginning showed that if you block the uterine arterial supply, uh, hemorrhage can be controlled and then you can go for further surgical interventions. So uh, this is one of the Japanese study showing the role or a successful role in that particular. Uh, these were the indications where they used it. And this, they were, I think this is a 15 year long study and they definitely showed that this is going to be useful. Now, besides, even if you do that, there are many arteries which supply the, there are some 13 different sources where uterus can get blood supply from. So it may be very difficult despite of all measures that where uh, these bleeding may not be stopped. So uh, uh, going to the patient again, <clears throat> in such particular patients, we need to have a uh, hysterectomy as early as possible. It's a life saving uh, surgery and we cannot wait much in case it is necessary at that point of time, the intensive is obstetrician and anesthesiologist can take a combined decision depending on the optimization level of this particular patient. Now, what is more important is uh, it's a life-saving surgery. So we need an informed consent and informed consent has to be taken by a team. No one person can really leave it to junior and uh, take the, because the relatives often are in difficulty while giving this consent. And any delay from the relative side can prove very, very fatal. So somebody senior has to go and take this particular consent. Obviously, by the time uh, we take our consent, etc. Our <coughs> systemic optimization obviously will be continued. This particular patient received correction of acidosis. pH had come up a bit, and uh, high dose vasopressor were needed. And as I said, warming in terms of warm infusions as well as external warming was continued. <coughs> we need a very bold decision making uh, from the obstetrician side. Basically, if Somebody, we have seen people a little bit of hesitant to do surgery because patient's outcome, especially if imagined negative, there is little hesitancy, but I think it will be uh, actually not in favor of patient. We have to somehow take consent and go for this life-saving surgery. And from anesthetic side, there is no question of any fitness. Patient is absolutely unfit for any kind of anesthesia here. 
we'll see the slide of NSSA also. But I think as much possible optimization will be necessary, and uh, that that should be done. So shifting the patient from either emergency room or from ICU to OT itself is a challenge, and it's often left to junior. And I will try to emphasize here that somebody senior has to accompany the patient because patient is really bad. This particular this case is a little old, so that time pancronium was used. And basically, during transport also, we need a transport ventilation because the ventilation has to be ensured as we are doing it in ER or ICU or in the OT. So during transport, which may be a time of 5, 10, 15 minutes, depending on the logistics, we have to take care of appropriate ventilation uh, so that uh, there is no problem in that. And of course, if the infusions are going on, we need battery operated syringe pumps. That is very essential because we cannot discontinue other pressures at this point of time. And we need a monitors which can be showing us all the possible parameters. Preparation of operation theater, uh, warming available in the operation theater. As I said before, I'm just re-emphasizing that in OT, we have to continue. We do not know how much time we will be sending in OT, mostly from 45 minutes to two hours, depending on uh, surgical interventions, which will be necessity and necessary and the uh, optimization or complications which can happen in the operation theater. Now, say salvage has been used by many people because there is always a shortage of components, etc. But this will be available in a very few places and can be considered where it is available. As I said, anesthesia is a challenge in these patients and mostly cardio-stable drugs will be given. This was the time of pentazosin when I used uh, this particular case was done. So ketamine, pentazosin and uh, uh, obviously, local infiltration also can be contributed. Uh, uterus was found to be fla uh, flabby and bleach discoloration was there. So bilateral internal iliac ligation was done. Uh, hysterectomy was uh, needed for this particular patient. Uh, there was no, despite of coagulation abnormality, clinical bleeding was not observed. So that is one good sign that you can always have some uh, solace from avoiding any over transfusion of components. Uh, patient did receive uh, so, many, so many components there, basically, and the moment uh, the hysterectomy was, you can see that bridge discoloration, hysterectomy was the moment uh, uh, uterine, uh, I mean, hysterectomy was done, BP started shooting. So probably some chemo mediator release from the uterus was responsible for the shock status, and we had to rapidly decrease the uh, water pressure requirement because BP was shooting. It is also important. It is CO2, just like we are using it in a post resuscitation period. Here also, you can see the ETCO2 level of 17 in shock status, and it also, with the same minute ventilation, it improved to uh, 28. So, that improved circulation or improved oxygen supply to the tissue will obviously lead to increased uh, CO2 production, and CO2 will also improve. So, that we have to have close watch on ETCO2 as well, because that also tells us about perfusion. So there was no bleeding tendency observed, and the uh, patient was shifted back to ICU. Antibiotics were given in appropriate way. Uh, uh, these are later ICU management part of it, because this patient will be remaining on ventilator for some time. So usual uh, fast drug of, of which we practice in the intensive care unit, all will be necessary. So uh, thrombophylaxis as well as all usual supportive management will be needed. So this particular patient obviously uh, showed improvement in the arterial blood gas, as you can see, which was 6.9 there and 7.246 now, with improvement in most of the parameters, including temperature and the circulation. Uh, we had such kind of improvement uh, seen in this particular patient. Uh, look at the hemogram. The platelets are still on lower side, the WBC on higher side, fibrinogen on lower side. Coagulation still quite a bit deranged. And this is the time, first time noted that uh, serum creatinine has gone to 2.2, which was normal before. So uh, this, this was expected in, this will be expected in most of the patients who are into shock. And as you can see, there is a uh, 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 oliguria as well. And uh, despite our attempts, we often land up in having uh, over transfusion. So probably this particular patient has uh, pulmonary congestion as well. And <clears throat> uh, we may see delayed kind of uh, the, this phenomena. Once the clotting factors and components are given, there may be possibility that they will still be short and building tendency may be seen even at later point of time. So we have to we keep watch on uh, this particular. So building tendency obviously will be evaluated by coagulation parameter study 
and appropriately corrected, of course. And uh, the renal shutdown, which occurred in this particular patient, obviously needed hemodialysis and uh, some blood products obviously were given. So this is the total picture of blood products. In any classical case of this kind, we'll uh, have this kind of a uh, uh, requirement of uh, blood products. And this is the hemogram for this particular patient over time. So massive blood component requirement will, can be there in this particular patient. And uh, eventually this particular patient uh, needed uh, renal replacement therapy and ultimately survived. So it, sometimes it can be, we think uh, it's really miraculous because in the beginning, we never thought this patient will survive. But I think teamwork, appropriate decisions, and the very aggressive kind of intensive care management will be needed in this particular patient, looking at all the aspects which so far we talked. Uh, so obstetric hemorrhage uh, still remains a challenge. As I said, aggressive treatment will be needed. A jumpstart approach for blood component transfusion, not to forget the hypothermia and the problem during the transfer, as well as talking to the obstetricians to have all the surgical measures in place. And of course, multi-organ failure, which has set in later, uh, or may also have uh, to be looked into as a part of intensive care management subsequent. So that is all about the PPH. We'll go to the second part uh, in short to the severe PI patient. This is a typical case which was uh, uh, seen with blood pressure of 170 by 120. It's a full-term patient uh, with symptoms of headache and uh, increasing swelling uh, over the uh, over patient. Of course, I had a proteinuria as well and the diagnosis was confirmed. A PI diagnosis needs to be confirmed by ruling out chronic hypertension, which may patient may have, gestational part of hypertension, as well as some other cause. But mostly a proteinuria and high blood pressure with pregnancy should make uh, you sure that this is the pregnancy-induced hypertension. And uh, uh, our aim, obviously, is to confirm the diagnosis, to control the, control the blood pressure, and, of course, to prevent the convergence and uh, to have some decision about the delivery in this particular patient. So uh, mostly these patients will present with this kind of a high BP. And our attempt is to uh, decrease the blood pressure, but not very rapidly. And uh, initial uh, plan should be only to have 20% uh, decrement in the systolic blood pressure when it was uh, what, what the value or the level was. And uh, further decrement or a rapid decrement in blood pressure may precipitate into fetal distress. We don't want that to happen. And so we don't have to try or attempt the normalization of BP right very rapidly there. So goals will be to maintain diastolic between 90 to 105 and not go below 90 as far as possible. Patients, uh, this is just a slide showing what other drugs patients may be already on. The first line treatment is by these drugs. Second line are these. These uh, ARBs and uh, SMBs are contraindicated. And parental agents which we'll now be using in these particular patients are in terms of labetlar, hydrolagin and uh, magnesium sulfate. Sometimes nitroglycerin and sodium nitroglycerin may also be necessary. The acute medical therapy is usually by these two drugs, labetalol, and the uh, usual dose of labetalol necessary in this particular patient is 20 milligram IV. Uh, now th this has to be looked into carefully because this is very important. 20 milligram of uh, labetalol given over uh, at least one minute slowly. Look at the pulse and BP both. You can repeat double the dose uh, in increments every 15 minutes or 30 minutes as required and uh, looking at the hemodynamics of desired kind. If required, obviously, you will need the infusion. You can have uh, infusion prepared and uh, your rate will be approximately uh, about 10 to 20 milligram uh, per hour generally. You have to titrate it. And if required, you can increase the infusion rate. And target, obviously, is to maintain diastolic above 90, between 90 and 100. Another agent is hydrolyzing, which is also now available. Uh, the doses are about one fourth of labetrol just to compare, and uh, it's available as one milligram per ml. Five milligram given slowly over 15 minutes initial dose. Check the hemodynamics. Uh, again, aim is to uh, maintain between 90 and 100, and uh, you can repeat the additional bolus doses given IV slowly. Five milligram per hour is usual rate required. You can titrate it downwards, and uh, you can have the uh, appropriate control of blood pressure. So these are the two drugs which we commonly use. Most of the people are using labetalol as a first choice. Now, prevention of seizures is very, very important. And uh, this high blood pressure with BP control, we also have to think about seizure prophylaxis. And magnesium in loading dose 
which are available. I have shown the two diagrams. It's available as ampules as well as uh, wires, and the concentration is same in both. It's about 500 milligram per ml. That's for 50% solution. So we need intravenous dose of 50% magnesium sulfate. You can dilute it and give four gram intravenously over 20 minutes at the first bolus slowly, and subsequently start IV infusion of one gram per hour. Now, generally, additional bolus may be needed if patient gets seizure on the magnesium therapy going on. So two grams intravenously over five minutes can be given as an additional dose and sometimes additional dose of infusion may also be needed. But most important is to uh, prevent magnesium toxicity. You can have a clinical uh, orientation to see that there is no bradycardia, hypotension, there is no altered mentation because in this patient obviously mentation may be fluctuating but you can have the trend of mentation being monitored continuously. <clears throat> but best is to have deep tendon reflexes being monitored and that uh, can give you some idea. And besides that, you can always have a magnesium levels tested, but that uh, clinical monitoring can tell you when it will be necessary. And these are the normal uh, levels and the therapeutic levels and the toxic levels, which we have to monitor if required. Now, if there is a possibility of magnesium toxicity, you have to stop it, give IV calcium and look at the other harmful effects due to or toxicity effects of the Magnesium, which may be in terms of uh, depressed respiration, altered mentation, as well as uh, hypotension, bradycardia. In case uh, you have to use alternate anticonvulsant, we have all these three choices available. This midazolam, these are the doses generally given uh, in the first uh, setting. And uh, these three drugs are midazolam, lorazepam, and phenytoin are available. Phenytoin, you have to take care that uh, if you're loading phenytoin with 500 to 1000 milligram intravenously, it has to be over 30 minutes because there can be a uh, tachyarrhythmias or ventricular tachycardia, which is quite resistant for any treatment. So, phenytoin cannot be given as a fast bolus. So, just to put in that in mind. Now, regarding the patient's decision going for uh, 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 delivery, because that's one definite treatment where all these things can be prevented and delivery has to be planned. Optimize the patient, look at other morbidities, which may be there if help is around, then we have to look at coagulation, we have to look at the uh, other uh, systemic evaluation in terms of RFP and the left is uh, Basically, for this patient, uh, regional is encouraged because uh, it has a good analgesia property. Uh, precipitous hypotension, when, which was discussed previously, is not a reality. Basically, it is well maintained because there is a high catecholamine level in the body and uh, vascular tone is reasonably maintained. Even if you block at spinal level, uh, sympathetic blockade does not affect much circulation. There will be some hypotension, but uh, circulating catecholamine surge maintains uh, the blood pressure reasonably well. And if any if there is a hypotension, we have vasopressors at our hand, we can always uh, Now, what is the problem with general anesthesia? Why it is important for intensivists to know that there will be many colleagues from anesthesia side who have become intensive, but uh, those who are probably not we'll have to remember uh, certain things about anesthetic aspects as well because you'll be definitely a part of uh, team discussion when the surgical decisions are taken and patient management is done in the intensive care unit. So GA has a higher risk of uh, of because of certain reasons. And what are these? Generally, airway is difficult in pregnancy, especially if there's obesity and a lot of water retention uh, in uh, severe PIH patients. All these problems are there. And if there's an airway difficulty, there can be trauma, local bleeding and aspiration possibility. And main cause of problem, main uh, challenge in this patient is with laryngoscopy, you will have systolic hypertensive response to laryngoscopy and BP going 200 plus can have a possibility of IC bleed. So these episodes can be killer for the patient. So that's why GA will be less prep. Now somebody will ask, uh, uh, eclampsia was previously taken as a contraindication, but if the patient uh, has a reasonable sensorium, can maintain the airway, you can have a regional consideration in uh, this particular patient. If the patient is needing, going to need intubation for some other cause, obviously then the regional may be ruled out. But otherwise, most often now people give regional and it has a reasonable evidence base to do that. So uh, as I said, systolic hypertension has shown in this particular study, shown 54% maternal deaths related to hypertensive or systolic hypertensive surge. So it should be always in the mind that we do not allow the BP go beyond 180 at any point of time by any maneuvers. We have to have additional doses of drugs if required. But if BP shoots and there is an IC period, that's a disaster. Most often these patients uh, 
will receive the fluids are usually restricted and uh, peripheral vasoconstriction in all pregnancy induced hypertension patients uh, uh, invites for restriction of fluids in this particular patients but still some patients uh, perioperatively may show this talent that they have been transfused or infused more volume and there can be pulmonary edema so this is one particular case where uh, she where uh, pih was detected in at 6 month and obviously she received usual treatment of anti hypertensives including the magnesium sulfate uh, at that point of time and <clears throat> day 3 she developed a uh, very high blood pressure as well as breathlessness she deteriorated rapidly and uh, clinically as well as radiologically she was uh, found to have pulmonary congestion so when this particular kind of respiratory distress come there can be a lot of other differences as well just for academic purpose uh, we have to keep in mind that pulmonary edema is one possibility but uh, acute respiratory distress due to like currently we had so many cases of viral pneumonias uh, there have been some conflicts whether this patient is in pulmonary edema or there is a uh, severe ards due to viral pneumonia there is something called as tocolytic induce because once you stop the tocolytes in pregnant patient at some point of time in 24 hours of time the vasodilator effect uh, which is a side effect actually of tocolytes because when uterus is relaxed there are blood vessels also get relaxed and when you withdraw tocolytics there is a vasoconstriction added and that shifts the volume from the systemic circulation to pulmonary circulation and that is typically called as tocolytic uh, induced pulmonary edema this is one possibility we have to keep in mind treatment doesn't change much uh, aspiration and of course uh, underlying disorders if at all are there uh, those will also be there and there can be other pulmonary complications in cardiovascular uh, there is something called as peripartum cardiomyopathy which may not have been diagnosed before and we have had surprises in the icu and on table as well sometime that uh, contracted and once good eco machines are available now we can always have this diagnosis right away there and uh, there can be uh, pre existing uh, valvular disease which of which quantum is now less we don't see too many valvular disease what we used to see about 20 years back and of course embolic disorders where venous thromboembolism is on the rise and we have to be very very careful in all these patients the uh, especially in covid and post covid period we have seen so many uh, thromboembolic uh, events including uh, pulmonary embolism as well as cerebral sinus venous thrombosis etc and uh, in this particular we are talking in terms of respiratory distress so amniotic fluid embolism and uh, other causes are also can be uh, seen in this now basic principles remain same i don't want to Uh, go into details because these are not part of obstetric per se but the usual principles are similar for managing these particular patients and uh, uh, any ards which we manage by usual methods uh, will be managing this which we will include high fio2 uh, psco2 or hyperpermissive or hypercapnia etc and uh, <clears throat> we have to be careful that uh, we don't uh, allow too much of hypercapnia because there can be deleterious for the uh, fetus so we have to be very very careful about it uh, usual drugs will be used and most of the drugs will be compatible with this uh, uh, situation and uh, we also need a fetal monitoring in between in case delivery has not been done now <clears throat> this particular patient was uh, shifted to icu labetalol was needed as we discussed urgent uh, cesarean section uh, decision was taken and uh, um, So this particular ventilation need requirement is always there and we do it with all possible precautions uh, necessary uh, these are the intra op details actually the uh, cesarean section obviously was done and uh, twin pregnancy was there so both babies needed intubation so that also has to be uh, readiness has to be there to revive the babies at that particular uh, point of time so you often you will need to continue the labetalol infusion in these patients even intraoperative period and eventually once uh, delivery takes place often the requirement of all the antihypertensives comes down uh, patient did show some pulmonary congestion but improved with usual treatment very rarely will be needed the uh, fetal delivery to improve this particular because there is this little controversial area where fetal delivery is done for maternal cause often that is not the indication literature doesn't support it because if we can manage and occasionally there may be indication that <coughs> fetal delivery will be needed for maternal improvement which can be done by discussion with this this case is obviously of uh, a full term case with uh, coming with breathlessness and uh, on echocardiography it was found that patient has 
decreased left ventricular ejection fraction and uh, this was diagnosed to be a cardiomyopathy case. Now we'll obviously have a usual treatment going on in terms of diuretics, vasodilators and the oxygen support if required. Uh, people have controversies about this. Many people go for cesarean section, which has more uh, problems as compared to vaginal delivery, which both will be having enough space on the heart. And uh, epidural analgesia is often advised in these particular patients where it is possible that uh, you can do the delivery. We had such two cases long back in KM when I was there. And uh, we managed both these cases, uh, giving epidurals and uh, having vaginal deliveries done in the intensive care unit itself. So the treatment is on the usual lines. You may need uh, digoxin, diuretics, and oxygen support if required sometimes, non-energy ventilation support. So going, going further, I think uh, uh, we are uh, short of time. Uh, this is a case where uh, uh, there was a desaturation when she presented. Uh, Caesarean section was done for uh, uh, probably the indication was PIH. And uh, then, of course, bilateral shadows were seen in this particular patient. And this was found to be probably uh, that particular time, I think H1N1 time was there. So this was... Uh, diagnosed as ARDS and uh, patient obviously pregnant patients even then and in the COVID also showed H1N1 was quite fatal in pregnancy. That time we had a lot of mortalities uh, in H1N1, but in COVID I think uh, it was relatively less. But we did have a lot of uh, morbidities and mortalities in COVID times as well. One more uh, critical uh, problem with us is sometimes though less often is amniotic fluid embolism. And amniotic fluid embolism uh, is, a, is obviously a diagnosis of exclusion. If you can exclude pulmonary edema, if you can exclude uh, uh, all other uh, causes which we described before, uh, then we can think of this. But it is a more complex problem in the intensive care unit than other things because it has a multi-system involvement, a uh, lot of problems with uh, uh, coagulation because there will be a cardiovascular collapse as well as coagulation abnormality. And there is no specific treatment. All treatments are so similar, uh, I mean, supportive. And uh, people have uh, used uh, up to ECMO everything to overcome this particular problem. So <clears throat> in absence of any specific treatment, we have to have supportive treatment. And I think most of the systems will need support besides cardiovascular. Uh, patient may have seizures, patient may have a uh, coagulation abnormality and of course, fetal distress. Now, pregnancy with jaundice, just uh, few, one or two minutes, few minutes on this. Now, what is common cause of jaundice in pregnancy? And as I said, hepatitis E epidemic is there with us and in rainy season, we'll often see these cases. Others are uh, tropical diseases, which will be dengue and uh, lepto and ricket cell, uh, etc. Then uh, health problems will be there. But most uh, dangerous or disastrous is the acute fatty liver of pregnancy. Now, there will be different uh, parameter specifications for this. But uh, in that acute hepatitis, by any chance, uh, diagnose the enzyme levels will be in thousands, and uh, prognosis will depend on what kind of uh, hepatitis it is. Some have treatment, some do not have treatment. We have to go by supportive management. Acute fatty liver, obviously, we have to have uh, urgent delivery done, and uh, these patients usually are having bad prognosis. They are prone for hypoglycemia and multi-organ failure as well. Uh, Intrahepatic cholesterol is rather benign, so we, we can always have some non-emergency thought process in this. Help obviously will be there as a part of a PI spectrum. Uh, we can look into that depending on the severity. And of course, tropical disease. This has actually uh, posed a lot of challenge because a lot of dengue patients coming for uh, uh, caesarean sections we have seen and coming in the ICUs. Now, these particular patients, uh, including rickets cell and they are sometimes lepto, uh, but dengues have been more common in current times. And uh, they have posed really difficult challenge because we have to optimize uh, not only coagulation, but there will be a metabolic uh, derangement due to renal as well as hepatic uh, problem. <clears throat> so in acute, any acute liver failure, these will be the problems, encephalopathy, uh, cerebral edema, coagulopathy, hypoglycemia, hypocalcemia, renal failure, infection, and respiratory failure. All these will be remedies for that. And I think they are a very common part of our intensive care management, and uh, they can be looked into a specific manner. Very rarely patients may be referred for liver transplant in current times because that is one of the options available in a fulminant hepatic failure. Even pregnant patients have undergone uh, liver transplants. <clears throat> so in these patients, the issues obviously come when to deliver, how to deliver encephalopathy and obviously there is a big possibility of bleeding in these particular patients. So optimization 
uh, will be needed. It will be a teamwork again. And any time you take a decision of delivery, uh, we have to have optimization continuously being done before we go for this. As I said, acute fatty liver is, though it is rare, often seen in third trimester, it usually has a rapid deterioration course with a multi-system dysfunction. The treatment obviously lies to have prompt delivery and uh, rapid component uh, transfusion if at all necessary will be needed. And there is a quite a bit possibility of fetal demise as well. So <clears throat> that has to be diagnosed quickly, looked into with systemic problems as much possible and have a delivery. Uh, in case there is a encephalopathy, obviously the causes of encephalopathy Altered sensorium with pregnancy, there can be multiple differentials. This is another problem because we often will find that patient has no PIH history, but a uh, patient is having encephalopathy. So there can be multiple problems. If patient is hypertensive, obviously eclampsia and IC bleed are the differentials. And there can be other systemic problems by which patient can be uh, in encephalopathy, which will include metabolic, hepatic, hypoxic. Not to forget cerebral venous thrombosis, as I said, uh, thrombotic events are on the rise. And uh, there can be other causes which may not be related to pregnancy. So all that has to be kept into mind and evaluated accordingly. Uh, last two points about uh, resuscitation in pregnancy, which is always a challenge. Uh, we obviously have the usual protocols been uh, followed for uh, CAB. Defibrillation is must, drugs are also needed. And obviously there is something called as a, a perimortem uh, emergency cesarean section. So we pose, uh, we, uh, the pregnancy poses some challenges in CPR where you find as uh, ribs are flared up, diaphragm raised, there is a lot of edema, large size of breast can come in, chest compressions, and uh, superior position or supine position, of course, has a uh, infravenous compression there, uh, limiting the venous return coming in, and of course, uterus will contribute to that. These are the specific challenges during CPR uh, we face. Now, there may be a difficulty in applying defibrillation pads if required. Uh, because of um, uh, breast size usually and uh, sometimes magnesium level uh, in the patients who have received magnesium can be contributory factors. We have to look into all the history and if there is a magnesium uh, toxicity possibility, we have to treat that also or even the hyperkalemia sometimes. This is a perimortem cesarean section, a uh, uh, few lines about that. There have been uh, big series reported, some of 72 cases. Very surprising, 52% fetal survival, 15% patient survival. That's not bad because this, these will otherwise will be a hopeless situation. So if somebody has such kind of scenario, don't hesitate from doing uh, this kind of a thing. And I think this will need a lot of uh, uh, training to all of us, including our obstetrician colleagues and anesthesia uh, Obviously, uh, here the question of anesthesia doesn't come much, but it will be done in a very short time and uh, it has to be on the spot itself it cannot have any chance of taking patient to even operation theater or labor so it has to be on the spot <clears throat> so uh, usually done by midline to pubic incision it's a life-saving procedure if at all a vertical uterine incision and uh, cut through placenta deliver the baby as early as possible generally uh, four to five minutes uh, will be allowed and otherwise it will be difficult to make the patient survive so to summarize, in general, we came a long way with multiple, uh, some initial emphasis on uh, hemorrhage and uh, PIH. Uh, hemorrhage has a high mortality. If the patient comes in our hand, we'll obviously make best of our uh, uh, abilities uh, applied to all the possible uh, uh, making patients survive. So there's a high mortality. We need a very, very aggressive management uh, by the whole team, not only by intensives, but uh, all other people who are involved, other disciplines. PIH, obviously, systolic hypertension is a killer, and that was quite clear from that particular series. So we have to see that we don't allow this blood pressure of 180 plus at any point of time. We have so many drugs available with us. Uh, peripartum respiratory distress, there are quite a few differentials, and as we saw the list, we have to rule them out by whatever available to us. Acute fatty liver has a very bad prognosis generally. CPR in pregnancy can be very, very difficult, and uh, we have to know what are the difficulties possible. And again, I'm saying it's a very highly coordinated job to be done by everybody so that we can have a best outcome for this uh, young pregnant patient because they are all revivable. And uh, though we did not discuss sepsis much into because of lack of time, the sepsis in pregnancy is also important because urinary tract infections, respiratory infections have been commonly seen because pregnancy is a little bit of immunocompromised status. 
So we have seen so many patients, uh, pregnant patients coming with different kind of infections, including tropical ones. Uh, we didn't have time to discuss, but we all know the sepsis guidelines and one hour bundle and uh, next bundles as well. So we go by that. And I think uh, that may not be in the scope of this particular lecture. So I thank you again, Dr. Gunadar Raklesh, uh, for this kind of opportunity to discuss this rather vast topic. And it was really a challenge to cover in going into all the minor and major integrities of this particular topic. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I think you have, uh, this is a very lucid uh, talk uh, and you have wonderfully described all the uh, obstetric emergencies in a nutshell. And so just to summarize, I think uh, in five minutes, so what we have discussed uh, and sir has described, like uh, the causes of different obstetric hemorrhages, like uh, whether it is obstetric cause purely or it's a medical cause. So they can be divided into obstetric hemorrhage primarily and PIH, pregnancy induced hypertension, the amniotic fluid embolism, acute fatty liver of pregnancy. And of course, uh, the medical causes are many. And uh, they started from septic shock to the different life-threatening respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, peripartum cardiomyopathy, pulmonary embolism, your uh, myocarditis of different grades, then uh, low respiratory tract infection, your viral pneumonias, and also encephalopathy and en encephalitis of different origins. And of course, the septic shock is also one of the contributors. So these are the these are the different presentation, uh, starting from the cortical venous sinus thrombosis in the medical literature. So sir has also described like the what are the different resuscitation starting from the airway breathing circulation and how the airway of pregnant patient is different from the normal individual and what are the difficulties and what are the different measures and the newer tool of course like 2D echo and the ultrasound which is now gaining momentum more and more in the obstetric critical care. The monitoring and the newer gadgets to monitor the uh, different bleeding parameters like the thromboelastography and newer therapies of hemorrhagic control like uh, factor 7 and prothrombin complex concentrate, the tranexamic acids, <coughs> the different medical and surgical interventions to control the hemorrhage, of course, like from the interventional procedures uh, like uh, uterine artery embolization to be your uh, billing suture application to balloon tamponade to, of course, the internal ileic artery ligation and uh, the hysterectomy, the last resource to control the desperate measure to control the hemorrhage. And the medical problems associated with like hypocalcemia, hypothermia, and what are the different anesthesia challenges. So what in a nutshell I can say, we can see a variety of uh, uh, the critical care issues, whatever is possible in a patient like multi-organ dysfunction to coagulopathy to your uh, multiple transfusions, massive transfusion protocol, shock of different causes, the critical illness, polyneuropathy, myopathy, because these patients, once they develop into multi-organ failure, they remain longer time in the ICU and their course is obviously prolonged and they go into different kind of uh, all these ICU-related problems right, from different infections to sepsis and multi-organ dysfunction. And the PIH management, sir, has beautifully described, like the BP control and the, uh, the, the seizure control uh, protocols like magnesium sulfate protocol and BP control with labetalol, hydrologin, and the anesthesia management for such patients, the GA particularly, which is very high risk nowadays, and the last slide, which is very important, like the different cardiac arrest algorithm, which is totally different, and one has to be absolutely take care of supine hypertensive syndrome and perimortem uh, seizure and section. So uh, with this, the broad uh, background has beautifully covered in not cell, uh, uh, all the aspects, and I will invite the questions one by one. So uh, I request to put all the questions in the chat box. One question I can see here yeah. is, uh, what percentage of blood loss should be replaced by crystalloids? Uh, when patient comes and uh, in a variable state of uh, bleeding, which already occurred, uh, we may need immediate blood components, which may not be immediately available because it takes about 40 minutes for cross-matching until then, we have uh, crystalloids mostly given in the beginning. But uh, starches are generally discouraged. Though in this particular case, we did uh, see that starch was given. Uh, colloids, obviously, in terms of uh, gelatin-based colloids will be preferred as compared to uh, starch-based colloids. But first, volume resuscitation is as much possible is by balanced salt solutions and even normal saline. And what percentage of blood loss should be replaced by crystalloids? Obviously, we monitor hematocrit, which is the acceptable level, and blood loss is not going to be continued. Then, obviously, uh, usual crystalloids will be needed. Blood components only will come after that beyond a particular. 
Yeah, so one more point that I would like mm-hmm. to add, like, you know, pregnant patients have a different physiological state and they are uh, in a hypervolumic state at times. You know, unless there is a substantial amount of blood loss, these patients may not pose any challenges or, I mean, they may not present as a shock. The usual definition of shock, like, we, we, you know, we, class, we classify them into class 1, class 2, class 3, 4. Class 1 is something which is uh, 15%, and class 2 is 30%, and 40 and 40 is beyond 40 or something like that. This classification may not be true in pregnant patients unless they have substantial amount of volume loss. So it is always understood uh, that, you know, whenever patient is exsanguinated and they are in a shock, probably we should consider that they are definitely in a stage 3 shock or something like that. And then preemptive steps for volume resuscitation, blood and blood products, you know, transfusions will be very important. I hope you agree with this. Uh, I mean, yeah. So we uh, in, lot of in uh, yeah. yeah in current in current times, uh, th- these were all given as percentage of uh, blood losses. But in current times, we go by uh, continuous monitoring if required by even the lab parameters. Clinically observed blood loss. The lab parameters showing the hematocrit and coagulation uh, problems, and accordingly we decide our component therapy. Uh, a blood loss which was described as the stages of shock will remain as a guide, of course. Uh, obviously, replace the crystalloids. How much crystalloid volume will be needed? Again, will be described. Uh, will be monitored by uh, continuous monitoring, which will be clinical as well as by ultrasound and echocardiograph. So, sir, have you used factor 7 and uh, this uh, prothrombin complex concentrate for control of yeah. the uh, PCC is now available, uh, it seems. I have not personally used either of these. Factor 7 we have used in some cases before, few years before. But currently, I don't think we have uh, really been using it and nobody really advocates. Because as I said, factor 7 will need uh, requisites are obviously to have a surgical control as well as uh, re, uh, optimization of the other clotting parameters because fact, uh, other clotting factors. Factor 7 is just one. There are many other components needed for uh, coagulation. So unless they are replaced, factor 7 alone cannot be uh, really a magic. The majority of these patients will have a DIC kind of a component. Our usual parameters of PTINR also may not be you know, uh, indicative of uh, the actual situation of coagulopathy. Do we think thromboelastogram will be a better option here because it is, it is not available in majority of the centers? So because most of the times we are clueless. We keep on correcting with the blood products after products and then still coagulopathy doesn't get corrected. Of course, there are other factors, you know, hypothermia, acidosis, which is a lethal triad, which can also contribute to coagulopathy. But we we don't get uh, you know, you know actual idea about coagulopathy. Do you think thromboelastogram also would be recommended in this situation? But I have seen uh, thromboelastogram of course will help. And as I said, uh, we could not elaborate much on that. The pattern which is seen in the thromboelastogram can guide you which component is deficient and needs to be replaced. I have seen some uh, uh, colleagues being uh, giving prophylactic uh, FAPs etc. I don't think there is any role for prophylactic FFPs as such. You can always have them as a standby in the blood bank, but giving them before uh, really is not evidence best. But some people are practicing that. So thromboelastogram actually has really changed some of the practices, like sir rightly told. So you can uh, find one can find the pattern of the coagulation dysfunction, whether to transfuse platelet or FFP or coagulation factors like cryoprecipitate. Or fibrinogen. So those can actually uh, get from the thromboelastography. And whenever the acute ongoing hemorrhage, so most of the bleeding uh, test is mostly unreliable. And in those situations, the dynamic viscoelastic properties, which is basically the take take into consideration or rotem. So these are the two important aspects which can help for the to intensive to transfuse. Like whether to transfuse the fibrinogen. Of course, in any bleeding patient, the fibrinogen is the first uh, component what we replace and uh, followed by the whether it is a platelet dysfunction or it is a like the coagulation disorder. So in that way, actually... So targeted transfusions can be advocated. So targeted transfusions can be advocated, you know, uh, and unnecessary transfusions can also be avoided like blood and blood products or several other products are given unnecessarily because, you know, transfusion-associated lung injury or other complications related to transfusion are also very, very common. 
when we have a massive transfusion for obstetric patient so i think uh, these uh, gadgets can definitely help us so uh, sir as far as the medical legal implications are concerned you know obstetricians are also trapped in uh, uh many you know situations where they have to face maternal mortality brunt we know that you know they have 42 days of norm till the time they have the responsibility and then how do these challenges can be taken over you know if you want to avoid uh, you know falling prey for all such situations Uh, because you are a lawyer also, and uh, will you be able to guide the obstetrician in terms uh, of this, uh, so, uh, I, so that they can be very very cautious? Yeah. So as far as legal aspect of this is concerned, we we just have to be very very clear, transparent, and we evidence based in our approach. And as I said, we have to be aggressive on our side. We have to save the patient. The problems only come, as I said, uh, mentioned in between. Uh, if you take go for taking a consent patient may not immediately agree but you document even the delay done by the patient because that may come to your help later on you have to discuss video consent audio video consents are there at this point your documentation has to be very to be very clear no mistakes in decision making the transfusion record and uh, whatever counseling you are done that has to be documented taken the signature of the patient and as many relatives possible and it has to be done by seniors if you leave it to junior and if the or your subordinate make some laps you are responsible for any legal impact to it so i think if you are uh, aggressive if your team is perfect your documentation is correct and you are not your system is not prone for any mistakes uh, i think legal problem even if it comes you'll be able to surely defend because we have done all the possible attempts to Save the patient in that given emergency. Yeah, so okay. ownership with multidisciplinary approach probably will help us. Everybody has to take the ownership. Everybody has to take the ownership. Yeah. So yes. there is one important okay. questions in the chat box actually. So it is rightly told by Doctor Suchitra like Doc PPH is mostly a surgical emergency. Yes, of course it is logically to optimize the patient as much as we can in the ER. And skip to the operating room with ongoing resuscitation. Is it a right approach? What do you think, sir? Like uh, when the patient is in unstable condition, we talk. So do you... no matter no matter uh, patient first comes in emergency room. Obviously, when it comes in emergency room, you have to have a good emergency uh, team if that is there, and even if there are deficiencies, the ICU team, the anesthesia team, and the obstetric team have to go to the emergency and sort it out. Everything right there. Optimize the patient there itself because hopefully most of the major tertiary care centers have reasonable emergency backup uh, emergency room itself. But rather than shifting patients in hypotension, if you can optimize the patient, including the lines and intubation and ventilation there itself, then patient probably will direct from going to uh, uh, ICU patient there from there may direct because if everything is done there. Uh, Then probably you will need ICU only post-operative. So, if the emergency room is geared up by manpower, by uh, skills, by availability of uh, equipment and expertise, mm -hmm. all the teams can go there and stabilize the patient. If logistics allows. If not, then only the patient will be taken to ICU and maybe to the operating theater. I think the the same principle is followed when the patient uh, is shifting from the lower center to one of the tertiary care center so little bit uh, stabilization itself in the in the hospital and then shifting the patient sometimes uh, really helps like you told like taking so starting with anatomic support like starting with the vasopressors then intubation securing the airway and uh, fluid resuscitation and uh, of course the correcting the metabolic parameters as far as possible quickly and that sometimes helps during shifting very much Rather than uh, just shifting the patient, unstable patient, sometimes they may collapse in the on the way. So uh, this is one of the approach. Many many patients yes, have yes. died on the way, and we have received dead patients, uh, which could have been probably saved had the sending person probably done a better job than what it was. Uh, you know, so uh, it it's a very tricky situation when patient is shocked in a nursing home. We don't have all the expertise and resources to manage that patient there. 
and often the patients will be shifted in uh, a shock status uh, of possibly unoptimized and often the patients have reached in a very very crash state like this patient also we is in a very very uh, a crash condition and of course uh, logistic difficulties there are limitations and we must say that our 108 uh, in maharashtra at least has and even all over the has done a very good job of uh, providing uh, critical care on the wheels for uh, uh, most of the times almost it is said that 30% of the times these uh, uh, ambulances at periphery are used for the pregnant patients who have some other kind of echo stop that that job is being done so so basically we give lot of emphasis for stroke patients we give emphasis for mi patients similarly obstetric emergencies also should be notified as a stroke code like stroke code or mi code we we go ahead i mean similarly such code can be activated and all the team members can come together and start resuscitating and surgical you know or intervention or hemodynamic resuscitation is required and all that i think a coordinated and close with communication uh will definitely help even during transportation if the patient is notified the continuous information from the receiving end also uh or the uh, the patient from which the hospital, patient is coming from the other hospital so the continuous uh, communication and notification will also help us prevent a lot of uh, catastrophe and disaster yeah so so I really like your last slide actually the the patient's persistence persist, uh, perspiration and decision so all this all these all these will be needed in this particular type of patients yes, 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 yes. yes. see just to show the big team work will be needed and we need a lot of uh, patience and precision to be applicable to be applied when we are treating this kind of patients yes sir yes sir absolutely so i think with uh, no more questions here uh, and uh, with the interest of time we would like to wind up the today's sessions and uh, i really appreciate and uh, thanks uh, uh, dr bala sahib bande sir from our department of critical care medicine apollo hospital and uh, thanks to all the delegates who are present here it's a, uh, definitely a great sessions and uh, with so much uh, thing we learned from here and uh, we will like to have more and more such academic uh, sessions with you sir in the future sure it and thank you sir again once again. thank you very much sir thank you it was an honor and privilege to have you with us sir really thank you very much sir thank, thank you so much good night sir good night oh, good night